so greetings from my side and good day to all i am myself dr vivek kumar sharma dean professor and head department of physiology greater noida uttar pradesh and today i am going to talk about uh, anterior pituitary gland so pituitary is also called as hypophysis and this gland lies in a pocket of the sphenoid bone at the base of the brain and it actually consists of three lobes the anterior lobe that is called as adenohypophysis intermediate lobe and the posterior lobe that is called as the neurohypophysis the intermediate lobe is not well developed in the human beings so when we see the structure this adenohypophysis and the neurohypophysis there is a distinct control that is coming from the hypothalamus if we see that the anterior hypothalamus what uh, it is actually having the capillary plexus of the hypophysial portal system and it is through the blood vessels that it is connected hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary and we when we see the posterior pituitary it there is there are the neural stalks it is the neural connection that connects the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary so what are the hormones that are released by the pituitary gland we know that pituitary gland is under the control of the hypothalamus and it hypothalamus causes the release of the releasing hormones and these releasing hormone then will ultimately in turn cause the release of the pituitary gland hormones so the hormones released by anterior pituitary are growth hormone thyroid stimulating hormone adrenocorticotropic hormone follicle stimulating hormone luteinizing hormone and prolactin the posterior pituitary releases two major hormones oxytocin and vasopressin and the intermediate pituitary causes the release of the hormone called as melanocyte stimulating hormone so when we see further these cells on the basis of the staining they can be divided into two major groups chromophiles which are nearly 75% and chromophobes which are roughly around 25% then these chromophiles can be further subdivided again on the basis of the staining into the acidophiles which are nearly 80% basophiles which are nearly 20% and the acidophiles are the somatotrophs uh, which are nearly 50% and mammotrophs and the basophiles are the gonadotrophs thyrotrophs and the corticotrophs so in this way the cells uh, are are there that cause the release of the hormones so these corticotrophs are going to give rise to the hormone called as adrenocorticotropic hormone lactotrophs will cause the release of prolactin hormone somatotrophs will cause release of growth hormone thyrotrophs will cause the release of the thyrotropin and gonadotrophs are going to cause the release of follicle stimulating hormone and the luteinizing hormone so these hypothalamus will cause the release of these hormones these uh, gonadotropins are primarily involved in the in the reproduction like the uh, st the stimulation of the eggs and the sperm production then the tsh or the thyroid stimulating hormone will actually cause the release of t3 and t4 from the thyroid gland that will do perform mul multiple functions including the basal metabolism maintenance prolactin releasing hormone which is inhibited by the prolactin inhibitory hormone will cause the will keep the inhibitory control over the prolactin hormone that is released from the pituitary gland and this is primarily involved in the milk production during the pregnancy and lactation then growth hormone releasing hormone is going to cause the release of the growth hormone and as we know that growth hormone performs a lot of functions during the puberty and otherwise in the healthy adult life Uh, via the mediation via the IGF one production and ultimately it causes the growth of the person. Then we have the corticotrop releasing hormone that causes the release of ACTH hormone, which stimulates the adrenal cortex, all the three layers, to release the mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, and the androgens. So coming to the introduction of the one of the major hormones that is studied in the anterior pituitary is the growth hormone. now growth hormone as we have just discussed is secreted from the somatotrophs it's a polypeptide and it is secreted episodically that means there is a diurnal variation in its secretion and one of the primary features is that during the deep sleep there is a large pulsatile burst that causes the growth hormone secretion 
so if there is insomnia or if there is sleep any abnormality is there growth hormone secretion might be affected and uh, it is produced by the long arm of the chromosome 17 that contains the gh hcs cluster genes so growth hormone it is primarily of two major forms that is the 22k growth hormone that is roughly around 90 percent and 20k growth hormone that is roughly around 10 percent so synthesis it uh, like any other uh, polypeptide hormone what we see that it is synthesized as the pre pro hormone in the rough endoplasmic reticulum then it gets converted to pro hormone and finally it is packaged and stored in the granules of the somatotrophs growth hormone secretion is intimately related to the sleep architecture the largest pulses of growth hormone secretion occur before midnight as we can see in this graph and most of the secretion is done during the night hours only and this is the reason that growth hormone injection is administered at night whenever there is a growth hormone deficiency disorder Now, what is the rate of the growth hormone secretion throughout the life? If we see that, we find that this is one of the major hormones that is involved and released during the pubertal stage. Although the level keeps rising from the infancy to childhood to pre-puberty and puberty adulthood and slight decrease occurs during the old age. But the peak, we can see it, it occurs during the pubertal period and it is responsible for the growth and the development of the body during the puberty. So coming to the regulation of the growth hormone synthesis, the normal basal plasma growth hormone concentration is roughly 2 to 5 nanograms per ml in the adult and the secretion actually depends upon the action of the growth hormone releasing hormone that is from the hypothalamus and the somatostatin also on the somatotrophs of the anterior pituitary. So GHRH is going to cause the stimulation and somatostatin in the hypothalamus is going to cause the inhibition of the somatotroph release of the growth hormone release from the somatotrophs of anterior pituitary. And growth hormone is causes, it uh, controls its own secretion by the negative feedback mechanism. So we have the growth hormone releasing hormone or somatotropin by hypothalamus and the growth hormone inhibitory hormone that is primarily somatostatin that is also released by the hypothalamus. And also now the new studies are also suggesting that there is a third regulator of growth hormone that is from GIT, ghrelin that is secreted from the synthesis from the stomach and uh, it stimulates the growth hormone secretion and that is also involved in the regulation of the food intake ghrelin hormone so this is how it looks like we have the growth hormone stimulatory hormone and the somatostatin hormone which have uh, respectively the positive and the negative impact on to the secretion of growth hormone from the somatotrophs in the anterior pituitary ghrelin also comes into the play and it also causes the regulation uh, of growth hormone and this growth hormone mediates its effects directly onto the body into the tissues or otherwise through the IGF-1 which primarily is released by the liver and other organs. These tissues whenever there is a too much of rise of these two of this, uh, so of, uh, this growth hormone then there is a negative feedback inhibition that inhibits its own synthesis and secretion. So this is how it looks like.
the solid arrows are the simulatory effects and the dashed are the inhibitory effects and this is how we find that as in any other form we find that there is negative inhibition that occurs at both at the level of the anterior pituitary and at the level of the hypothalamus by the growth hormone that is produced. So this ghrelin, growth hormone, stimulatory hormone, somatostatin, they all will play a part in the regulation of the growth hormone synthesis. It is finely regulated. So growth hormone, as we have just discussed, we can again see the peak over here. The growth hormone secretion is maximum in the midnight where the person is in the deep sleep. And that is why it is intimately linked and the people who are having the insomnia or any sort of the sleep disorders, they might have the growth hormone related issues. So what are the stimuli that cause an increase in the growth hormone secretion? There are multiple stimuli, but to focus on a few of them, the exercise and the fasting. So if there is now the new concept of intermittent fasting, which says that a person becomes a healthier, one of the mechanism can be that the intermittent fasting or in any form, any form of the fasting will cause an increase in the growth hormone secretion. Protein meal and infusion of the arginine and protein and the glucagon, all these factors along with hypoglycemia, they cause an increase in the growth hormone secretion. And the stressful stimuli, pyrogens, then going to sleep and uh, various psychological stressors and the estrogens and androgens and various other factors, they are also responsible for an increase in the growth hormone secretion. So what are the factors that cause a decrease in the growth hormone secretion? There are multiple factors, but few of them are, first itself is that when there is too much or excess of the growth hormone or IGF-1 via the negative feedback inhibition, it will, it will decrease its own synthesis and release. Then REM sleep, glucose, free fatty acids and progesterone. These are few of the factors that cause a decrease in the growth hormone secretion. So now let us see what is the mechanism of action of the growth hormone. So growth hormone comes and binds to its receptors. When growth hormone binds to its receptors, it leads to the dimerization of the receptors. And this dimerization of the receptors leads to the stimulation of the cytoplasmic proteins that are called as the genus tyrosine kinases or JAKs. So these become activated and they become phosphorylated. And these JAKs will then in turn cause the stimulation of other cytoplasmic proteins. These are the signal transducer and activator of transcription, simply called as STATs. So this will cause the activation of the stats. The stats will become also phosphorylated. And once they do so, they will then dimerize. And once they do dimerize, these stats will then now move from the cytoplasm into the nucleus. And in the nucleus, they will cause the stimulation of this uh, DNA response elements. And that leads to the transcription and followed by the translation of the proteins that mediates the effects of the growth hormone. So what are the fact actions or physiological actions of growth hormone? It performs actions in two ways. One is the direct action on the target tissues. Second is the indirect action that is mediated via the somatomatins. They are primarily IGF-1 and IGF-2, insulin-like growth factor 1 and 2. So direct action on the target tissues mediated by the growth hormone are primarily the effects on the growth. So we know that in the bone that it is responsible for the linear growth of the bone. That is how the height of the person increases. So it stimulates the linear bone growth due to its action on the epiphyseal cartilage of the long bones. And there is accelerated chondrogenesis, widened cartilaginous epiphyseal plates that lays more bone matrix at the ends of the long bones and that leads to the increase in the height of the bones. So the stature of the person increases by the action of direct action of the growth hormones. So the person keeps on growing, especially during from the, from the uh, adolescent age towards the adult. And once the person 
crosses this pubertal period then the growth actually the linear growth actually arrests the stature cannot be increased so these are the various reasons due to which we are able to have the growth promoting effect of growth hormone that it causes an increase in the amino acid uptake and protein synthesis then at the cellular level it causes an increase in the rna and dna synthesis increases the size and the number of the cells and there is more differentiation of the chondrocytes in the growth plates of the bone and also there is incorporation of the proline into the collagen and its conversion to hydroxyproline so it actually promotes the cartilage and the matrix promotion formation that causes also the increase in the tensile strength of the bone and also causes an increase in the stature of the person then we come to the other growth promoting effects of the growth hormone in the bone there is an increase in the osteoblastic activity that facilitates the bone formation increasing both the total bone mass and the mineral content of the bone and at the level of the skeletal muscle it causes an increase in the muscle mass by causing an increase in the protein synthesis and the hypertrophy of the skeletal muscle and it also promotes the activity of the satellite cells of the skeletal muscle then thereby causing an increase in the muscle mass of the individual then not only at the physical outer structures but at the level the concurrent the, the simultaneous growth of the visceral organs is also promoted so as the stature of the person is increasing it also stimulates the growth of the visceral organs that is like liver heart pancreas kidney and all other organs so this increase in the organ size is primarily because of an increase in the protein synthesis rna dna synthesis and also both increase in the cell size and the number of the cells then the pubertal and the gonadal growth it increases the height during puberty sensitizes the gonads to the action of the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone it also promotes the prepubertal sexual maturation it plays a very important role even in the sexual maturation so now coming on to the intermediary metabolism uh, one by one again if we see its effect on the protein metabolism it is primarily an anabolic hormone so what it will do it will cause an increase in the positive nitrogen balance and the positive phosphorus balance increasing the amino acid entry into the cells it will increase the protein synthesis of the in, into the in the cells and thereby causing an increase in the muscle activity so metabolic activities of the growth hormones coming to the other one carbohydrate metabolism it is actually a diabetogenic hormone that means it causes increase in the blood glucose level and how does it do so so when the growth hormone increases we our body needs more amount of the fuel so that it can be utilized for the anabolic purpose for that what liver does is liver will undergo the glycogenolysis and as well as the hepatic gluconeogenesis by causing increase in the production of the glucose from other sources like the proteins and fats and also when needed it can also give rise to the glycogenolysis and it decreases the glucose uptake in the skeletal muscle in the adipose tissue so the glucose stays within the blood and the blood glucose level is rises and it also decreases the insulin sensitivity so thereby it can be considered as a diabetogenic hormone effect on the fat metabolism it is a lipolytic hormone it causes a decrease in the body fat percentage so it does so it activates the hormone sensitive lipase and thereafter therefore it causes an increase in the plasma free fatty acid levels and it also promotes the ketogenesis because of an increase in the availability of the free fatty acids in the blood therefore when the person is not having the normal physiology or in a pathophysiology it can ketoacidosis in plasma actually increases so let's summarize the metabolic effects on protein it is anabolic in nature and on the fat it is lipolytic that means it causes decrease in the fat mass and in the carbohydrates it is a diabetogenic hormone what are the metabolic other effects on like for example effect on the electrolyte metabolism since it is anabolic 
it will cause an increase in the entry of the of these minerals into the cells and also will increase the absorption from the git so it causes increase in the calcium absorption from git and uh, it decreases the excretion of sodium potassium and phosphorus in the urine and then these minerals can be utilized by the body rather than being lost from the body for the growth of the tissues now coming to the indirect actions of the growth hormones so the direct action we have just discussed the indirect action of the growth hormone is primarily mediated via the somatomedins which is also called as the insulin like growth factor 1 and released by the liver so one of the factors can be one of the major thing is that this is all this also causes increase it helps in the increase of the stature of the person so these somatomedins or insulin like growth factors secreted from the liver these are the principal circulating we know that the principal circulating somatomedins are insulin like growth factor 1 and in utero the insulin like growth factor 2 is also important they are, they are called as igf because their actions are similar to insulin so and its effect is primarily on the growth cartilage and the protein metabolism and it is due to an interaction between the growth hormone and these somatomedins that the growth occurs so now coming to we know that there is igf 1 and 2 what is the actual difference between the two the IGF-1 is called a somatomedin C and the source is liver. IGF-2 is produced by the diverse tissues and this IGF-1 is primarily regulated by the growth hormone after the birth and it is, and it is dependent upon the nutritional status how much it will be released. So its level is regulation is not known exactly and it this level increases at puberty however we don't see a peak over here at the time of the puberty and its major physiological role that we all should remember is that igf1 is important for the skeletal and the cartilage growth whereas the igf2 is responsible for the fetal growth so it plays an important role before the birth of the uh, of the child before that during the fetal period only the growth of the person is dependent upon IGF-2. So growth hormone will mediate its direct effect. It will cause retention of the electrolytes. It is diabetogenic. It decreases the insulin sensitivity and it, it is lipolytic. So it reduces the body fat. It increases the protein synthesis and it will also cause an increase in the stature of the human being. And via its effect on the IGF-1, IGF will have insulin-like effect. So through this, what we can expect is that it will cause a decrease in the blood glucose level and it will be anti-lipolytic that is lipogenesis and protein synthesis and again the epiphyseal growth. But then these two things will be, uh, these are counter regulatory to the direct action of the growth hormones but ultimately what it leads to is the action of the growth hormone is always diabetogenic so the actions mediated by the growth hormone and igf1 are the primary two ways through which growth hormone mediates its action on whole of the body coming to the disorders of the growth hormone now it can either be the hypersecretion of the growth hormone or it can be the hyposecretion of the growth hormone when the hypersecretion of the growth hormone occurs in the adults, it is called as acromegaly. And when it is observed in the children before the epiphyseal fusion occurs, before the pubertal period is over, it leads to another disorder that is called as gigantism. So, what is acromegaly? Hypersecretion of the growth hormone after the fusion of epiphysis. So as we know that growth hormone is responsible for the, the vertical increase of the height of the individual or the stature of the individual. So it will keep on occurring until the puberty is over. When the epiphyseal fusion has occurred, the person cannot further increase the height. So at that time, if the growth hormone secretion keeps increasing, then it leads to the situation called as acromegaly. There can be multiple causes of that or etiology of acromegaly two of the major ones are that there is hypothalamic tumor and that that is causing an increase in the release of growth hormone releasing hormone 
that ultimately it causes the release of the growth hormone in the patient or it can be the tumors of the somatotrophs of the anterior pituitary itself so what are the features that we see in the case of this now the vertical height cannot grow but there is change in the physical structures what are they we find that there is frontal bossing and what we see is that the peripheral regions which are also called as the acral parts the hands and as well as the feet of the individual they enlarge there is prognathism that is protrusion of the lower jaw there is frontal bossing and there is prominent of the brows and then acromegalic faces that means there will be overgrowth of the frontal and the facial bones and of the malar there is increase in the size of the visceral organs within the body visceromegaly then it because there is too much of the crowding of the joints it leads to the osteoarthritis and it can also lead to the gynecomastia in the males in the females it can lead to the hirsutism and there can also be typically when there is too much of this acromegaly due to these causes what we have discussed it is due to the this visual field changes may also be observed that is called as the bitemporal hemianopia so acromegaly what we can clearly see over here is that there is frontal bossing there is increase in the number of the size of these eyebrows then there is protrusion of the lower jaw then it also leads to the coarse features that is hirsutism also in the females and uh, like that the whole of the structure of the person changes diagnosis of acromegaly is made by the presence of the typical clinical presentation in the patient and also the demonstration of the tumor by ct or mri and the raised growth hormone levels in the plasma management involves either the surgical removal of the tumor or the somatostatin analog octreotide most commonly is given that binds to the somatostatin receptor subtypes and inhibits inhibits the growth hormone secretion and it is effective in roughly 65 to 70% of the patients then if this growth hormone continues to rise right from the adolescent or to the childhood age before the puberty is over this hyper secretion of growth hormone because we do not have the fusion of the epiphyses the vertical growth keeps increasing the stature of the person keeps increasing and this is called as the gigantism and it is primarily it can be due to either the childhood pituitary tumors or the hypothalamic tumors the clinical features are like they are abnormally tall and they might have most of the features that we have just discussed out in the acromegaly so what we do for these types of the patients we want that this growth hormone should be inhibited it should not be released in the excess so one of the medication that is tried out is the octreotide or lanreotide that causes the inhibition of the excess of the growth hormone release now coming on to the other side now what will happen if the growth hormone is not released or there is hyposecretion of the growth hormone deficiency of growth hormone before puberty will result in the dwarfism and the, uh, there can be multiple causes of it for us it is suffice to remember that the growth hormone will not be in the adequate amount and due to which the vertical or the stature of the person will not increase there can be causes like ghrh deficiency or growth hormone deficiency due to the decreased release from the somatotrophs or the liver is not able to cause the release of the insulin growth factor 1 and or even if it is released the receptors of the growth hormone are not that responsive or they are less sensitive to the action of the growth hormone so pituitary dwarf it is it this is what we usually see the physical stature of the person will be decreased short stature delayed sexual maturation decreased muscle mass total body mass and the bone density but the important thing is that the mental development is nearly normal it does not affect the mentation of the human being so we diagnose it by the low levels of the growth hormone or the igf1 levels
And what do we do? We give the treatment via the administration of the various growth hormone preparations that will actually before the puberty, uh, before the pubertal period is over, if we give growth hormone preparations, then it can try to it, it be through this we can try to increase the height of the person and various other abnormalities can be corrected. So one can be the familial constitutional delay in the growth or the short height. Pituitary dwarf means that the person is having short stature, normal de mental development and uh, the person is absolutely okay in every way but the sexual maturity is not there and the stature is short. But we have also studied in other lectures that the hypothyroid condition especially in the childhood can also lead to the dwarfism. The difference being lying over here is that here everything is okay, the body proportions are also okay in pituitary dwarf and the mentation is okay. It can be differentiated from the hypothyroid dwarf as over here the body proportions are, are not normal and the features are primarily infantile and the mental retardation is seen. That means the mentation of the person is going to be affected. So let's come to now the applied physiology. What are the various growth hormone preparations or the stimulators? The primary indication for the growth hormone preparations is in the pituitary dwarfism which is given primarily this growth hormone is given by the IM or, IC or subcutaneous root or intramuscular root and uh, nowadays it is being produced by the recombinant DNA techniques and somatotropin or somatrem are usually given. And early diagnosis and growth hormone therapy institution restores stature to near normal. And these positive results in the children with constitutional short stature are seen. Now, there is another flip part to it. See, now since we know that the stature can be increased, it is also being abused also. So, commercial interest is promoting it even in the normal child to accelerate the growth. And that brings lots of medical, ethical, cost benefit and these social issues into play. So we should not overuse it or we should not do the unethical use of the growth hormone but because it can lead to the various other disorders in the human being although the stature may be increased. So these growth hormone preparation stimulators, they are uh, given in the adult growth hormone deficient patients although there they will not increase the stature but they can be given in various conditions where we want more growth to occur. For example, a patient who is suffering from severe burns, people who are having bedridden patients who are losing their calcium, they are losing all their nutrients or in various conditions like osteoporosis or the chronic renal failure. And it has also been approved for the AIDS related wasting. So in these conditions, it is approved even in the adults. Another important thing is that somatropin has been included in the dope testing as this drug has a very high abuse potential by the athletes for the performance enhancement and it is primarily so because it causes decrease in the fat mass, it increases the muscle mass, it also helps us in increasing the stature and as well as the strength of the body. So it is being misused in or abused by the athletes in some conditions and therefore it is also a dope test that every athlete has to go through before participating in any athletic event. Now the inhibitors we have just talked octreotide there is synthetic octapeptide that is 40 times more potent in inhibiting growth hormone secretion and it is also the longer acting and it acts via the IV route and so this uh, octreotide is given and uh, we are having this acromegaly and uh, secretory diarrheas are associated with AIDS, cancer, chemotherapy, diabetes etc. And it is also being utilized in stopping the esophageal variceal bleedings. To summarize what we have discussed today, peptide hormone, this growth hormone is a peptide hormone that is synthesized by the somatotrophs in the anterior pituitary. It is a major participant in the physiologic processes including the growth and metabolism. It mediates actions directly and through IGF-1 that is secreted by the liver. The metabolic effects are that it is anabolic on the proteins and causes the positive nitrogen balance. It causes decrease in the body fat and so it is lipolytic. It increases the blood glucose. It is diabetogenic hormone. 
growth hormone excess in the adults causes the acromegaly and in children it causes the gigantism and deficiency can lead to the dwarfism thank you very much for listening to this lecture